In January this year, before all hell were let loose with the coronavirus pandemic, the CDC group was looking to invest two billion pounds in Africa businesses over the next two years. Jenny Meter discussed overseas investments in Africa with the virus grabbing the headlines is Agnes Jitao. Agnes is based in London and she's a partner at GBS Africa. Good evening, Agnes. Welcome to the show. Good evening, Boston. It's good to see you. So how critical are overseas development finance to Africa under the current coronavirus pandemic? Boston, you know, financing for African projects has always been a challenge, even before COVID-19, as you rightly put it, is going to play an important role going forward because obviously we've seen a fall in commodity uh, prices, we've seen uh, suppressed remittance flows, also governments are not able to collect, rev uh, to co to collect revenues. So there is a gap that, rem that needs certainly needs capital and that capital will not come from private uh, private capital as you've seen uh, the common narrative the common perception that africa projects are risky obviously deters private investment and that's how uh, overseas development finance comes in to bridge that gap so it is critical but i think the conversation going forward is how can we make it more effective because boston it's been over four decades where africa has continually depended on overseas development finance you've highlighted the figures there do we have a plan b what happens you know post covid 19 the beggable west also have competing priorities right so we need to think very quickly and first on what our plan b is in terms of financing these projects that you highlight mm. When we talk about the development agencies, uh, whether they're private or what are called the DFIDs the, the, uh, and, and the rest of them, do you think they've really done enough for Africa in terms of the size of what they've brought into the continent? Or is it a function of where this money is gone? I think... I mean, what is enough, Boston? We've talked about Africa's financing need. Our infrastructure sector requires at least $93 billion annually. Talk about the healthcare sector, over $66 billion annually that is required to finance that sector. So what is enough? I mean, combined, uh, these developmental finances have, let's say, maybe $100 billion um, that they can put in our market. But is that enough? So I go back to, do we have an alternative? Because certainly, over four decades of dependence on this, this, this uh, external financing, yet we're still so poor and you're still having to deal with, with challenges that are now um, induced by COVID-19. If you have your way, Agnes, uh, in what critical sectors of sub-Saharan African economies uh, do you think uh, we should have more of the overseas development investments? Is it in critical brick and mortar infrastructure, road, rails, airports, power, or you think they should invest more in private equity businesses, SMEs, uh, small businesses, and, 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 and uh, venture capitals and all of that? Look, every sector requires money, but I think it's important to redirect the financing to sectors that are generating more jobs and creating employment for our people. So SMEs, for, for example, last week you spoke, I watched you speaking about financing for women entrepreneurs. So this is a sector that has been uh, neglected by a lot of, um, you know, PEs and, and, and DFIs. So we need to focus on sectors that are job uh, uh, generating jobs, but are also key sectors like education, healthcare, water and sanitation. Perhaps I think for me, the role of, 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 of overseas development finance should go to these sectors, perhaps de-risk them so that we are able to attract more, more, more investment from private capital. Do you think, uh, when you look back at what has really been done, do you think some of this, in, in, in all sincerity, do you think they've really lifted Africa's economies uh, in, in very critical areas? We've seen uh, agencies of the government donating to, to healthcare in some areas like cholera, that are like uh, trying to mitigate maternal mortality, uh, 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 polio, and, and, and other areas of that. Some have also invested in businesses. But the key question you ask is, are there enough? Do we need to look inward? So if we are going to look inward and we're trying to develop local capital here, how do you think we can get it done, even under the current circumstance? 
So governments need to be more creative and innovating in the way they they collect the revenues. Look, annually, African governments uh, uh, collect at least five billion dollars in terms of revenue. Right? Where does this money go to? How much do we get from uh, overseas development finance? Around a hundred billion, perhaps per year, or even less. So we are, if we can become more creative and in collecting our revenues and in reinvesting that money in the sectors you highlight, I think that's the way forward. Otherwise, uh, constant dependence on the beggable West has made Africa lazy and, 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 and we lack creativity. And every time we have a crisis, as you've seen with coronavirus, we run with our begging bowls to the West. So yes, we need to start looking inwards. And we've talked, you and I have had a conversation on the importance of tapping into diaspora remittance. So yes, inward looking and, and encouraging Africans to invest in our market and, and also promoting trade and, and, and commercial engagement amongst ourselves rather than this constant begging. It is shameful, person, and we need to move away from this dependence. So you sit now in London, you're a Kenyan uh, by, by birth. So uh, are Africans in diaspora interested in investing in the continent aside the huge remittances that we've seen into Nigeria, despite the pandemic, the level of remittances from Kenyans, folks like yourself back home to Nairobi, uh, Mombasa and elsewhere uh, keep rising. So are there interests there amongst those of you in the diaspora to bring bulk money into brick and mortar investments in Africa? Yes, and we're already doing that. You know, uh, GPS Africa was very instrumental into rallying investment into the continent. And yes, diasporans are looking for incentives and they're also looking for sectors um, that, that obviously can generate money. And I think they're, they're driven not by profit mostly. I think they're driven by patriotism, but also that we are seeing our governments taking, uh, making initiatives and providing inroads for diaspora uh, investment. And Nigeria, I must uh, applaud Nigeria Diaspora Commission for the work they've done in trying to tap or to channel diaspora investment. So, Boston, yes, uh, capital for Africa is key, and capital for more areas from overseas, de um, overseas development finance, from private equity, from from debt. Um, uh, from capital markets, but it is not enough to keep bringing this money and wasting it into sectors that are not resourceful. Uh, do you think we need to improve uh, ease of doing business in Africa? I'm sure your answer will be yes. So in what areas would you like to see more improvement? Because if folks are bringing their money in, uh, whether you're an African in diaspora or, you, or not, uh, you need to ensure, you want to ensure that the environment in which you're putting in your dollar, your pound, your, your, your yen, whatever currency you're bringing in, is, uh, is good enough. So what are you looking out for? What are you hearing on the ground in terms of improvements in doing business in Africa? I hope I don't tire you by speaking about transparency and governance. That no. is key to avoid wasted. Mm -hmm. I think that's something we must address as Africans. You ensure that you have transparency in the way we conduct our business. Second of all, of course, is the cost of doing business. So investing in energy. And now we've seen some inroads in, in government inf infrastructure investment. So the cost of energy is one of the biggest barriers to investment. Then access to finance. We talk about finance. Access to finance make it easy for businesses to be able to have to access affordable finance to do their business and more and more invest in human capital. We need to employ Africans, in, in, invest in education so that we can have Africans who are employable. Mm. Uh, if you put all of this on, in the order of one to 10, what would be your, the top three? That's the main uh, concern when you folks gather together and talk about uh, whether they're overseas investment or diaspora investment. So, you know, I talked about transparency and, and governance by my top, my, my top three would be, so uh, leadership becomes one. Obviously, we need to see an African leadership that, it, that is able to manage and protect investment, both from diaspora, but also from uh, DFIs and private equities. Uh, we also need to see more investment in infrastructure 
and the legal and, and uh, the legal environment, ensuring that when there is a commercial dispute, there is a platform to be able to address this. Because usually, you know, there is always um, delay whenever there, there, there are disputes in, in commercial dealings. So mm -hmm. uh, the regulatory framework, leadership, governance mm -hmm. and transparency. Mm -hmm. Agnes Jital, thank you so much. Partner at GBS Africa, uh, do have a great evening. Uh